Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to Kai Mathy's YouTube channel. Now, before we get this month's 20th anniversary retrospective review underway, here is the story so far. Handsome, mustachioed Colonel Engage of the 1st Regiment Foot and Mouth sat idly kicking his native bearer, Old Ram Singh, played by Tiger Tom in a skin, with a sickly grin. Suddenly, the door bursts open, and there, framed in the doorway, stood his lovely Titan head daughter, played by lovely hairy Titan, fantastic Mr. Connor. Father, she cries, someone has stolen the eye of the little yellow idol, played by little yellow bone idol Dicky, with a jewel in his navel. At that moment, the horrid lantern-jawed face of a high priest appears at the window. He screeches out a foul curse, which loses a little in translation, but roughly means I'm the king of the swingers. Right, now that you're caught up, you can sit back, relax, as this month we look at Devil May Cry 2. <laughs> Let's rock, baby. Devil May Cry 2, an action adventure hack and slash video game developed and published by Capcom, originally for the PlayStation 2. In terms of chronological order, the game's events are set after Devil May Cry and prior to the events of Devil May Cry 4. Set in modern times, the story centers on series staple protagonist Demon Hunter Dante and island guardian Lucia in their fight to stop a businessman named Arius from raising the demon Argosax. The story is told primarily through a mixture of cutscenes using the in-game engine with several pre-rendered full motion videos. The game was handled by a less experienced dev team than the first game in the series, which led to a troubled production. But despite this, Devil May Cry 2 was a commercial success. It established a number of series conventions and motivated its development team to improve their work, staying with the franchise for future entries. You called? Devil May Cry 2 is much like its predecessor, consisting of missions with specific goals in an area of play and fighting groups of monsters in fast-paced combat. You take control of either Dante or Lucia and players' performance in each match is ranked from D, poor don't worry, to S, excellent showtime. Based on the time taken to complete the mission, the amount of red orbs collected, the overall style displayed during fights and item usage and damage taken. Right, now, did you know that Devil May Cry 2's judging system has been cited as being the arshest in terms of how it judges you, the player, on performance? And also, if you're asking, no, it's not an Arto in his book. Combat in the game is rated much like it was in the first Devil May Cry. Your rating is based on the style you demonstrate during the fight. Your style is improved by hitting enemies continuously whilst avoiding damage, and they are rated from the range of Don't Worry, progressing to Come On, Bingo, Are You Ready, and peaking at Showtime. If the character takes damage, the style rating falls back to Don't Worry. The control scheme converts short sequences of button presses into complex on-screen actions. This time, however, there is a new evasion button which allows Dante or Lucia to roll, dodge enemy attacks or run along walls. Another new feature that was added is the weapon change button which allows a player to cycle through ranged weapons without having to access the inventory screen as you did in the first game. Along with combat, the game also has exploration elements and some light puzzle solving features, but gameplay has you the player exploring the surroundings to find red orbs that once again act as the in-game currency, allowing Dante and Lucia to acquire new combat powers and abilities, purchase items such as health restoration and even instant revives should they be killed by an enemy's attack. Dante's Devil Trigger ability returns, but now both him and Lucia are able to transform into a demon form. This increases their strength and defense, and their in-game appearance alters. Whilst in Devil Trigger mode, your health slowly restores and you're able to use special attacks, and other passive and movement abilities, including increased speed and the power to fly. 
Devil May Cry 2 introduced the unique Desperation Devil Trigger, an enhanced form of Devil Trigger that Dante can use when he is low on health and needs to heal. Devil May Cry 2 is the only game in the series that uses the Desperation Devil Trigger ability. Yeah, now did you know that you can also play as Trish from Devil May Cry 1 in Devil May Cry 2 if you beat the game on hard mode with Dante? Or you know, you could just use an old school action replay and save yourself the trouble. Now did you know that you can also get infinite red orbs as well? Yes, now to do this, find some red orbs in the mission and then press start and restart the mission. You'll have all the orbs you found in the mission already. This works best in the Nesferatus mission. Once you've beat Nesferkarpolis, immediately press start and then restart. You'll be able to collect infinite orbs. Yeah, thanks lad. Now get back to tea making. Leave video games to us, right? Okay, now, where were we? Ah, yes, right, now, you've unlocked Trish without cheating. Trish's gameplay is very different to Dante's. Whilst retaining some of his moves, she has her own form of sword combat. Trish can also switch between the Sword of Sparta and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Trish doesn't have a Devil Trigger, she uses a power-up aura. Right, now, we're about to talk about the plot, you know, spoiler warnings, you've been warned. Lucia and Dante separately enter a museum, where an important item called the Arcane Magdalia is stored. After defeating a group of demons in the museum, Lucia invites Dante to follow her to Vidu Marley, where he is introduced to Mathieu, her mother. Mathieu explains that she once fought alongside Dante's father, Sparda, to defend the island against demons. She asks Dante to help fight Arius, an international businessman who uses demonic power and seeks to conquer the world. Dante flips a coin as an answer and decides to help when the coin lands on heads. After Dante leaves, Mathieu and Lucia discuss the arcane, the items required for Arius to release Argosax. Lucia eventually confronts Arius, who reveals that she was his creation. When Lucia moves to strike Arius, he uses his magic to blast her away. Shortly afterwards, Dante meets up with Lucia, who gives him the last of the arcane. Before leaving, Dante encounters Mathieu and tries to pass the arcane to her. Martia in turn asks Dante to take the arcane to save Lucia, who has gone to fight Arius again. Dante flips a coin again to decide if he will help. It lands on heads and he departs to aid Lucia. Meanwhile, Lucia enters the Ouroboros building and attacks Arius, who captures her. Dante arrives and trades the arcane for Lucia, then attacks Arius. To escape, Arius forces Dante to decide between saving Lucia or killing him. Lucia, worried about the ritual and conflicted about herself, wonders how they will stop Arius. Dante waves her off, stating that he will find a way. Dante leaves Lucia thinking that he has departed to defeat Arius. Martia arrives a short time later and sets Lucia's mind at ease, and then decides to rejoin the fight against Arius. Dante arrives to find Arius in the middle of his immortality-inducing ritual. Apparently not all the phases of the ceremony are complete, and Dante stands confident. Another fight ensues in which Dante finishes off Arius with his pistols. Outside, Lucia confronts Dante and demands that he kill her because she fears that she will become a demon herself. Before the issue can be resolved though, a large stream of energy strikes the tower and a portal to the demon world is opened. Dante and Lucia argue over who will enter and close it from inside. Dante offers to leave the issue up to fate. He flips his coin once again and it lands on heads. Dante enters the portal to deal with Argosax and leaves the coin with Lucia. After Dante departs, Arius returns to life bearing demonic powers. Whilst Lucia fights Arius, he finds himself injured and attempts to distract her, a tactic which fails and Lucia defeats him. Within the portal, Dante fights and defeats the partially summoned Argosax. Finding the portal closed, Dante instead drives further into the demon realm on a motorcycle. In the aftermath of the battle, Martia attempts to reassure Lucia about Dante's fate, insisting that Sparda returned from a similar trip. Lucia examines the coin that Dante left with her and discovered that both sides are identical. Sometime later, in Dante's shop, Lucia muses about Dante and how Sparda, having taken the exact same journey to hell, came back. Outside, the sound of a motorcycle echoes and Lucia leaves to investigate who it is. Yeah. 
Once again, we'll only be looking at the American English voice cast. Because this is turning into quite the video, don't you know? I was merely 70 when this started. I might be dead by the time we finish. Not before you've brewed up, lad. Now get back in that kitchen. In the role of Dante, we have Matthew Kaminsky, an American actor best known for his on-screen side roles rather than voice acting. He's still working at the time of recording and most recently in the Hulu Disney Plus if you're in the UK series Welcome to Chippendales, as well as the Netflix series Dharma Monster, the Jeffrey Dharma story. Providing the voice of Lucia is Françoise Gulewski. Françoise uses her role as Lucia in Devil May Cry 2, the scene at the end of the story before fighting Argo Sax, as one of her voice acting skills on her official YouTube account. She's worked with the leading voiceover dubbing studios and lends her voice to many American and European features and television series. If you'd like to see her on screen, she has a background part in Sharknado 2, the second one. Flo Dere is the voice of Mattia. Dere is probably best known at the moment for providing the voice of Joe Caster New in Star Wars Tales of the Jedi on Disney+, Plus, as well as in the Clone Wars and the Lego Star Wars video game The Skywalker Saga. Finally, we have Sherman Howard, an American actor and voice actor as the voice of Arius and the voice of Argo Sax. He is again still working as a bit part actor and voice actor. People might recognise his voice as Oliver Phillips in Red Dead Redemption. The music in Devil May Cry 2 was a collaborative project between Masatu Koda, Tetsuyo Shibata and Satoshi Se, who are all video game composing veterans working for Capcom. The soundtrack is certainly worth a listen. I personally have always thought it had very Resident Evil undertones, and considering several of the composers worked on the Resident Evil series as well, you can certainly understand why. It's a soundtrack that I don't skip when it comes on, although some of the tracks are better than others. It's available to stream on Spotify, and it's quite easy to find on YouTube. A physical copy was released in October of 2004. <laughs> After production wound up on the first Devil May Cry, Capcom management greenlit a sequel, but rather than have the sequel developed by the team behind Devil May Cry, Team Little Devils, a group within Capcom Production Studio 4 helmed by Hideki Kamiya, Capcom gave the project to Capcom Production Studio 1, a more arcade based dev team. The idea was to have a sequel released soon after Devil May Cry to capitalise on its popularity. Development would start with the new Team Devil dev team, under the management of Noritaka Funimazu, and a team of devs that were more used to working on fighting games. Kemia has said in years since that he believes the change up in dev teams happens due to lack of awareness over the director's influence on a game's style, and Capcom's attempts to balance profits due to the company being against keeping major IPs in a single division of Capcom. Right, basically right, Capcom management at the time were disappointed with the financial performance of Production Studio 1's output, so they thought right, here's an IP that can't fail to make us money, have a go at that chaps. Part of the issue was the change in the video game industry back in 2003. Capcom was traditionally split into two main pillars, an arcade division and a console division. However, with the release of the PlayStation 2, processing power was increasing in home console markets faster than it was in the arcade markets, and Capcom found itself doing a very quick company-wide shift of human resources from arcade to console. With console successes such as Resident Evil and Devil May Cry, dev teams who were working on arcade fighting games suddenly found themselves switched over to making games for home consoles, such as Capcom's Production Studio 1 who were put in charge of Devil May Cry sequels. At the time, Capcom Production Studio 4 general manager Shinji Mikami was all up for the switch as Devil May Cry sequels would require a large crew. Mikami though wanted the freedom to work on multiple titles himself, and at the time felt that Kemia lacked the experience working with small teams, so he put him on the new IP that would become Beautiful Joe. But Mikami failed to actually tell Kemia that that was what was happening, who found out when the Devil May Cry 2 game director asked him for the first game's screenplay and design documents so that they could develop a sequel, and Kemia at first thought this was the sign of an imminent firing.
Taking place after the events of the first game, Devil May Cry 2 introduces us to a re-envisioned Dante, as the producers didn't like the joke-cracking wise-ass. Dante of Devil May Cry 2 was more grown up and more taciturn. It means reserved or uncommunicative in speech. A man of few words, much like myself. Unless, of course, you're pushing the queue in court, then you'll hear some words. Rumour has it that the story of Devil May Cry 2 was outsourced to a non-company writer, but then veteran of both Production Studio One and the series Katsuya Akitomo was asked to make Dante's lines and behaviour in the tentative screenplay funnier as he was found to be too serious. The game's director only made small dialogue adjustments and wrote subtitles as he was juggling his job at Capcom with his career as a professional novelist, so by the time he got round to reading the whole script and making proper amendments to that script, it was in the translation process. Boss battles and stages were already done, so he was asked not to make any big changes. That's why there are moments in the game that come across as very B-movie-esque. The cast have lines of dialogue that seems to imply something big is happening or has happened, but then said thing never seems to happen. If you're confused, think of it like this. The game was being made the same time as the script was being written, and unlike the film industry, where that happens more than you might think, you need to know the story of your game before you can really start making it. You have to know the what mood is being set at certain points, so that the game's voice actors can act accordingly. Devil May Cry 2 was developed with the mindset of a live-action adaptation of a comic book. The main cast costume design was meant to represent clothing that real people would wear, and character design was made to complement and contrast Dante, and Lucio was designed as a counterpart to Trish. Yeah, while fitting a Capcom tradition of prioritising fighting ability over attractiveness in female characters. Now, did you know that Arius's face is a homage to Colonel Douglas Mortimer, a character played by Lee Van Cleef in a, For A Few Dollars More? Dante's redesign was meant to emphasise his elegance, but the accompanying personality change didn't endure. Character designer Tetsuya Yoshikawa, who worked on later games in the series, said they couldn't play the game because Dante's face was a little bit too scary. The Capcom Design Room illustrators were asked to create four cover images for Devil May Cry 2 in three weeks, which they did, and one of them was used as the game's cover, but they have said that with such a tight time frame, they weren't particularly proud of any of them. They have also said that the logo for the game was made after an all-nighter. The game's cutscenes were outsourced near the end of production to CG animation and motion capture studio Lynx Digiworks. Their work impressed the game's director, which led to the television commercial blending pre-rendered CG with live action. When designing the demons for the game, designers took inspiration from ancient and archaic portrayals of Japanese and Greek demons, focusing on elements that weren't already known to people at the time, as well as looking at western imagery of woodblock illustrations, Norse mythology rituals with pagan roots, eastern imagery and alchemy symbolism. And of course, the Bible. It's a game about demons, what do you expect? The character of Arius and their many forms, Possessed Arius was partially based on deep sea life forms, Arius Argo sacks on East Asian dragons, as the game director said that the strongest looking demons tend to be humanoid dragon ones, and Argo sacks is an amalgamation of all of the above, because they really just wanted to make him look weird. When it came to environments and locations, because of Team Devil's arcade dev background, they lacked the experience with texture mapping realistic resources. That meant that most of their textures were handmade, which led to the visuals being more drawing-like in comparison to the first Devil May Cry game. Near the end of development, motion animator Haruyuki Nara was drafted into Team Devil Development to work on two unlockables, Dante's Devil May Cry model and Trish, the latter featuring the former's playstyle. His original plan was to simply port over the data from Devil May Cry's source code. However, the first game's software crew had so much freedom over animations, their constant tinkering meant that the backup didn't reflect how the retail release behaved. So with the help of some other devs, Nara recreated the animations by eyeballing them on a television, running Devil May Cry side by side with his work monitor. Where is Mathieu? 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 Good grief. 
They really made a big mess, didn't they? <sighs> Since Devil May Cry told a complete story, Team Devil had complete creative freedom, so they opted to explore various directions, and Devil May Cry 2 was originally set in New York City and starred a man in a green jacket instead of Dante. But this was changed due to a number of factors, including the September 11th attacks. Devil May Cry 2's production was a very difficult process, with staff struggling against the lack of both know how in the 3D action games and manpower due to other titles concurrently in works within the division. Upper management saw Devil May Cry 2 as directorless, so brought in Hideki Iso with six months to the deadline. Iso himself had just finished work on Capcom vs SNK2 and doing the early concept for what would become Dragon's Dogma. He was brought in but was told that he would go uncredited but ended up as the only director listed in the final version of the game. Isuno planned a complete overhaul which would detach the game from the Devil May Cry intellectual property as a bit of a fuck you to upper management as he was angered at the sudden assignment. His thinking was that if he took the game in a major detour the game would be delayed and he would be taken off the project. Other staffing struggles included another dev that handled a multitude of odd jobs suffering bad physical health and at one point was coughing up blood and living in the office, just nipping home to wash and change clothes. They would sleep during their lunch breaks, but despite this, they were still invested in the series and often asked Hideki Kemi's advice on how to tackle the sequel. Devil May Cry 2 was revealed mid-2002 in a financial presentation, and then a trailer was showcased later that month at E3, although devs were vague in disclosing many of the game's features because they were still being worked on. Capcom pegged the launch window for early September 2002, but at that point the game was only 65% complete. A two mission long playable demo was showcased at the Tokyo Game Show in 2002, where it was the most popular game at the Capcom booth. Isuno did everything he could while struggling to release a quality finished product in the time frame given. In the end, features emphasised on previews as being accessible to both casual and dedicated players were cut from the game as they weren't up to scratch. Hello, don't worry, it's just me. I'm just going to ask you if you wouldn't mind turning the lights out when you leave. It's a bloody long game, this to talk about, you know. Anyway, some of the features that were taken out were automatically scaling the difficulty, fully customizable controls, and multiple paths for all missions. Several other assets from development were cut due to quality control, such as a plant's demon, a rival with abilities similar to Dante who could shoot energy balls and fly at any time, a boss who would have been a huge dragon with fire attacks, and Dante's motorcycle would have played a larger part through driving missions as a weapon. Sorry, yeah, just on way out now, but I'm just going to say Dante's motorcycle Alistair were also taken out quite late in game development uh, as pre-release stills still showcase in brandishing Alistair. Uh, Dante was also intended to vocally react to his style rating changing during combat. Right, uh, right, I'm off. See you later. Despite starting the project with extreme resentment, Isuno didn't want Devil May Cry 2 to be his legacy within the series, so before development had wrapped, Isuno asked the higher up for Devil May Cry 3, with himself as director from the start of the project. He rallied Team Devil to stay for it, and some members shared his sentiment, with many wanting to work with what they had learned making Devil May Cry 2. He'd accomplished everything his superiors wanted from him, although he wasn't completely satisfied with the final product. Sorry, I've got a bit of bedtime reading, but did you know that in November of 2020, Capcom was targeted by a ransomware attack, which led to a file box containing source code backup for Devil May Cry 2 leaking onto internet. Later. Devil May Cry 2 pleased fans who found the original too difficult, but it drove much of the player base away, which made Team Devil's goal to win them back with Devil May Cry 3. Devil May Cry 2 received mixed reviews, and difficulty was by far top of the complaints list. Reviewers also questioned the need for a second game disc, saying it seemed a cheap way for developers to increase replay value, since Lucia's missions are simply recycled material from Dante's missions with only minor variations. Overall presentation was criticised size as the environments were less detailed than the environments in the first game and it felt like the devs had traded in detail for open space. However, the game received some positive reviews. PSX Extreme, for example, countered arguments by many critics stating that the environments only looked worse due to their range and that the only reason Devil May Cry 2 failed to surpass its origins was due to the lack of challenge. People praised the game's new ideas as well as the idea of featuring two protagonists on separate discs calling Lucia's side of the story a cruel sonnet of self-realisation wrapped up in a story steeped in religious overtones. 
and saying that the story alone was a reason to purchase the game. Capcom positioned Devil May Cry 2 as a blockbuster title, and it did indeed sell well, becoming one of the top 10 best-selling games in the UK for the first half of 2003. As of 2022, over 2.9 million copies have been sold. Moody Dante, as I like to call him, he comes across as weird, right? I mean, his sudden silence between the events of Devil May Cry 1 and Devil May Cry 2 implies that something really bad has happened, but we never get to find out what. Uh, Lucia, Lucio, however you're saying it, her VO performance and animation, they really lack any kind of warmth. It's, it's really hard to like her as a character. Uh, what is really cool about the game though, and apparently the devs thought this as well, was the idea of having a CEO as the villain, this symbol of high contemporary culture as the bad guy. Now I know in this day and age it's not really that groundbreaking. I mean hell, the Devil May Cry series itself would return to this villain format in the series reboot in 2013. But back in 2003 in a much younger Kai Mathy, I loved it. However, I didn't love it enough to see the game through to the end. In fact, it wasn't until the HD remaster came out on the PlayStation 3 that I finished the game. I played through the first three games of the series in quick succession, and it really did hammer home how different Devil May Cry 2 is to the rest of the games in the early series. It also makes you, the player, very much aware that Devil May Cry 2 is the black sheep of the family. Should you play Devil May Cry 2 today? Well, I mean, it's readily available at the time of filming. It's on Steam, uh, it's on the PlayStation Store as part of the HD remaster of the first three games. And indeed, Devil May Cry 1 and 3 are fantastic. I can highly recommend them. Maybe just read the synopsis of 2 to fill yourself in if you're that fussed about the storyline. Yeah, the saving grace of Devil May Cry 2 is that it's over quite quickly. A standard playthrough will take you no more than about five hours, and even a completionist run, I think you can do it in under eight hours, as long as you know what you're doing. Now, if you are still watching, thank you so much. This really has been a long video. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Pat and Keith have gone home. If you've enjoyed it, please do let us know in the comment section down below. If you're not subscribed, please do consider doing so. It helps us out a great deal. At the very least, can you please click the like button or the dislike button. I have been Kai Mathy, and I'll leave you with this. Why do we nail down coffin lids? Cheerio, see you Friday.